All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Today, I'm joined by Catherine Nakalembe. Catherine is Associate Research Professor at the University of Maryland and Africa Program Director under NASA Harvest. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, leave us a five-star rating and review. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm super excited to speak with you and learn more about what you're up to. You recently presented on your work at the Machine Learning and the Physical Sciences Workshop at uh, this recent NeurIPS conference, and your presentation was on supporting food security in Africa using machine learning and earth observations. And we're going to dig deep into that topic. But before we do, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in machine learning. My background is in agriculture, remote sensing um, research. So, you know, before machine learning was such a big uh, component of the work that we do, I focused on agricultural land use and uh, drought monitoring using existing satellite data sets. And, um, you know, throughout my PhD, my focus was in, um, in Africa. So I've worked in Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya and Rwanda uh, and Mali, among other countries. And, um, you know, outside of just understanding how agriculture and food security systems work, I wanted to really figure out a way of utilizing uh, earth observations in the process. And so I learned a lot of things, including, you know, many uh, complexities around, you know, accessibility and utilization, as well as some of the limitations in terms of the data sets or the tools that were available specifically. When you start looking in, um, you know, smallholder agriculture, which is a dominant type of agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so in that process, you know, it became pretty obvious that in order to improve the monitoring and um, utility of these data sets, we have to improve the methods. And in the last couple of years, you know, there's been a huge boost and expansion in terms of um, integration of machine learning methods to take advantage of the existing data sets. And so we're sort of in this era where we are able to process a lot more data and you know, use, use much smarter or faster tools to do that. And uh, this is, of course, complemented by the fact that there's an explosion in terms of data sets, which means you, know, you need to be able to process a lot more, a lot more data sets in that sense. Uh, this means that we're able to look at places that were not looked at the same way. So we have much higher frequency in terms of observations which in addition to higher resolution data. And so being able to utilize those data sets and get insights in a uh, you know, quicker way requires that we use machine learning. Um, otherwise, you know, to be able to download and analyze data the way we did uh, last couple of years, it would not be possible, it would still be you know, snail speed. So it's a pretty exciting um, kind of prerequisite to work in this space right now, to be able to apply newer tools um, to you know, develop the best possible. Sounds like it's a transition that's happening pretty quickly in the space, as opposed to you know something gradual over the past ten years. So you know, prior to I would say from from my my own personal work that I kind of worked on, um, primarily we use decision trees, um, uh, random forests for a lot of the analysis that we did, and in addition to the fact that remote sensing data sets are big data by default. So you're looking at thousands and thousands of pixels uh, over really, really large areas. Um, it meant that very few groups could work on these types of data sets. So to analyze data for a small region, it could be just a county. In the past, you know, you need to be able, one, to download it. You need to have an HPC or um, you know a decent server in order to be able to analyze it. And so when I did my PhD at Maryland, I was in one of those departments where this was possible. You know, so it was like I was on the leading edge. But in the last couple of years, you know, with uh, cloud computing becoming you know more accessible, many, 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 many more people are able to do this. And so what that means is, you know, if you think about um, expanding access and utility means many more eyes, many more questions are being asked. They're being asked very different way. And so what that means is that there's a lot more innovation, there's a lot more creativity. 
there's a span in research questions that would not be possible at all um, in the past. And so that's why it's, you know, it's incredibly, it's incredibly changing. So you find that, you know, looking at flooding might not be important to somebody who lives I'm trying to think of a place where they did not experience any flooding. But if a person, let's say, who lives in a, you know, a, a small city that is constantly flooded, uh, that might be a critical question that they want to answer, right? And so if they ne didn't have the lab or the computing um, cluster to be able to do it, they would, never, they would never do it. But now the way things stand, there are all these uh, online platforms that allow you to access and analyze data for your own area, for anywhere you want to look. And that makes it really interesting um, in that sense. So that's why it's changing. Many, 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 many more eyes looking at something, you know, equals um, creativity, explosion, creativity, ideas, and uh, things that are being explored. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, in addition to your faculty post, I mentioned that you're the Africa Program Director at NASA Harvest. Can you talk a little bit about NASA Harvest and what it is, what it's hoping to achieve? Harvest started in 2017. It is NASA's and NASA's Agriculture and Food Security program. Um, the idea is over the years, NASA has you know invested a lot of money in terms of not only missions collecting data over you know over the surface of the Earth, um, as well as you know looking at outer space among other things. And they've invested a lot of money in terms of research. And so research around land use and land cover change analyses, research around water resources, understanding where our water is, what health that water is in. With these investments means there's, you know, an explosion also in terms of solutions, but a lot of these remain in research. Um, and so there are a few um programs that are working under what's called the Applied Sciences Program. So this the Harvest Program falls under the Applied Sciences Program. And the idea of the Applied Sciences Program is that there is research that's being done and it could be at several levels of maturity. And you know the highest level of maturity means that the outcome of this particular research equals you know influencing or impacting on a decision. And so Harvest is one that is focused on um, supporting decision making in agriculture through the utilization of remote sensing. And so if you think about somebody doing an experimental field, uh, field research to understand how maize grows and how you can you know, increase your productivity, that could just be purely a research paper, right? Um, but then getting from that research to be able to monitor it over a really large area, that is another level of maturity. So you monitor it over a large area, maybe you monitor it over a long time, but then uh, maybe a de the Department of Agriculture uh, decides, well, this information is telling us this particular region is not performing well for you know, the reasons A, B, C, D. And so we need to you know, develop a policy to address these concerns in that particular region. And so that research would have matured. So from just a field experiment to a large scale monitoring to then influencing what uh, the Department of Agriculture might do. And so Harvest is basically at that space to see as much research mature to that level um, but it's also a user-driven initiative in the sense that um, there is a use case in mind and so there have been lots of experimental small-scale studies that show the possibilities of things that you can understand and do better with remote sensing um, but not that many examples of them being used in decision making and so we're working in that space to move things uh, you know things further ahead in that sense. And we're trying to do it at a global scale. Get them in the hands of the folks that might be able to use them. Exactly. And I mean, the other advantage, of course, is that the fact that with satellite data, we have this kind of synoptic view. You can use the same satellite data over really, really large areas over long term. And so in places where action is or is, uh, you know, after the fact. So if there was a huge flooding event, uh, response is typically, you know, to help people get out of risky areas. There's potential that, you know, you could forecast that a little bit earlier, but then figuring out how to get the knowledge of the forecast into the hands of people who will be impacted is a whole other dimension. And so trying to figure out how to narrow that gap from data to decision um, is, you know, it's something that is really important. It's not, not something that's not really easy to do. And that's what um, Harvest is trying to do. Can you help us take a, a step back and kind of contextualize the the broad challenge of food security? Um, you know, the 
the number of folks that are impacted by it. And you've also, in your presentation, you, you shared your recent events that have catalyzed this need to, to be really careful, you know, even before COVID made, you know, things difficult for, for everyone in terms of supply chains and things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about the problem broadly? You know, with food security in itself, I think not a lot of people think about it. Um, even people who are, you know, experiencing it, uh, you never think about it as uh, food security. But what it, in, you know, in simple terms, it just means that you have food, you know, you have people, you have food all the time. So you not only have access to it, um, as in it is available at your grocery store, but you have the income or the money to be able to acquire it. And the other, you know, there, it has like these broad components around, um, so availability and access. So availability, it being at the store or coming from my garden, as, uh, um, and then access is, can I reach that garden or can I reach the market? That's, uh, you know, another component in addition to, can I buy it? And then utilization is that, you know, the, the quality of the food in itself. Um, so there might be food, but it might be, you know, um, no vegetables or things like that, uh, that are really critical for a healthy diet, right? Healthy, nutritious diet. And then stability is, um, is a, the other component, which means that food being available today, uh, but not tomorrow or not in two weeks. It's not a stable um, security. And so for security means all of those things and trying to be sure that you can sustain those over long term. And then, of course, there is, you know, having a sustainable food system means that all of these components are addressed over the long term. And so um, them being addressed over the long term means that food will be available, accessible and stable over a really long term um, for a community. And um, unfortunately, you know, we're not doing so great in that space uh, in terms of global food security. And I think sometimes, you know, it's portrayed as if it's, you know, in poor countries or, um, you know, lower middle income countries. But it's a widespread pro uh, uh, problem, including in the United States, where people worry, worrying about food and where your food will come from, you know, is a, one of the indicators of a food, secure, a food insecure household, for example. And so, um, you know, the numbers that have been coming out of these food security assessments are, you know, quite alarming where we have um, on average, you know, between 2020, you know, 20, 2019 till now, an average 828 million people um, without, you know, that are food insecure. And because of COVID, um, I think they estimated an additional I think an additional 200 million people from between 29, 20, beginning of 2020 until now. And that's because COVID impacted so many parts of our food system. So it impacted food access. Um, it impacted food production, people not being able to work and people not being able to, you know, things not being able to move at the pace that they used to move before. So food can be available at the market. And then, um, in addition to, you know, just the basic fact that, you know, food is not accessible, available, and, you know, to many people, we have, you know, the added context of the conflict um, between the Ukraine and Russia, where both countries being huge contributors to global food security. So, you know, the largest producers for some of the most critical crops, wheat, for example, maize, um, other, many countries are actually really struggling in the sense that if you think about a country like Egypt that imports, I think it was some 80 or so percent of their grain um, from one or both of them, not having any uh, wheat coming through for a long time, that means that food prices in um, Egypt would skyrocket, which you know impact on what people can eat. And of course, food systems are also very complex because there are also traditions around them. So you can't just substitute, um, you know, a standard traditional food with you know some other random thing. So you can't replace, for example. Um, bread typically made with wheat, with bread made with corn, sometimes you actually cannot reproduce it, you know, um, if you know, uh, like a naan or a, a chapati, for example. So, you know, those things are, uh, are incredibly complicated. And then, so outside of conflict, um, I'm just going to add, this is the last, the last uh, point I guess I'll add is that there are all these um, 
events that are happening that, you know, for a lot of places until the last couple of years, climate change has been something that's, you know, spoken about as something that could happen in the future or something that, you know, might never impact on, on, on communities. But if you look at, you know, the last couple of years, um, and if you look at a very specific area, um, you might find that overlapping, sometimes overlapping, at the time sequential events happen that wipe out entire food systems and sometimes entire communities. So you have extreme flooding events, you have um, things like locusts, you know, um, destroying crops. You have things like landslides, um, you know, that not only damage people's property, take many lives, um, but they also uh, destroy food sources. Um, I usually use this example in my presentations um, where there's this cyclone that happened in 2019, uh, Cyclone I Die. It was like around March 2019. And um, it affected a lot of countries in Southern Africa, cost so many lives, destroyed so much property. And while it was happening, you know, um, in East Africa, which is a few kilometers north of where the cyclone hit, you know, they were kind of at forecast this fantastic, uh, potentially good, uh, normal growing season. But because of the cyclone, um, moisture got pulled out of East Africa into the cyclone and what ended up you know what was projected to be a good start of season ended up being uh, a failed season there was like crop failure in kenya and so you have these extreme extreme events happening you know next to each other so if any of these countries depended on each other for you know multiple things you can see that you know none of that would be possible and so the it's usually the poor of the poorest that are um, impacted and so it's really really complicated and i think agriculture and food security are one of those things that let us lead us to think that we really have to think big we really have to think wide and we really have to think sustainably so, and you know things that seem so far away from us are actually not that far away your, your last example highlights the as you mentioned the complexity of these systems and all of the um, the interconnections across countries and regions. There are also, um, I guess, many players in the system. There are the consumers, there are the producers, there are stores, there are, you know, the inputs to production. Um, I get the impression that your research focuses on two particular constituents, uh, farmers and, and policymakers. Is that a, an accurate assessment? And, and you, can you talk about, you know, why those two and, and how you decide where to focus? My research, you know, is primarily trying to understand um, agricultural production and ultimately hope that what I understand and learn could be utilized by policymakers. And so we focus on understanding where crops are growing, how they're growing, and what the production might be. This is just like one of the things that inform uh, food availability, you know. And, you know, in the end, if you really want to understand that complexity of food security, you would need to, you know, go beyond just that. Um, and so you would need to understand how markets function. Uh, if an extreme event happens, is there are there potential things that can address this? And you being being able to figure out how to quantify those things is really critical. In some places, it's kind of I'm going to use the word straightforward, not so straightforward, but more, much more straightforward. So, if there is a flood, for example, in Maryland, right, and people's households are wiped out, you know, households have insurance. People might, if people have insurance, they might be, you know, be put up somewhere for a couple of weeks until things come down. Um, the, you know, Maryland, uh, national, um, the Maryland, uh, might have a storage, you know, a storage facility that they can bring, you know, medical equipment, food, among other things to support people who were directly impacted. In the case, for example, where that cyclone hit, this might not be possible at all. And so people have absolutely nothing. So what you want to do is prevent people being, um, in that situation. So we focus on, uh, trying to understand uh you know if you think about forecasting early where a drought might happen that could be really useful for if a government needs to respond to figure out where can they get food that can help support communities um you know you might want to think about things like infrastructure so it's it's it's, it's incredibly complicated and then for for the farmers really they're 
a, a great source of knowledge about what's actually really happening um, in a region. And even though we sometimes I think we think that we know better, uh, we rarely do know better. Um, we probably never know better because they're in that situation where they understand what is happening in their field and are the best place person to kind of address it. And so what you want to do is just give them um, context. So what is happening in a broader region, um, what might, you know, what is being forecast and what that might mean. So the example of the locust invasion in East Africa, I think the UN had predicted that there would be an invasion. Um, maybe I'm going to say eight, nine months actually early. The reason for this is, you know, the locust um, habitat, the way locusts lay their eggs and everything is something that is very easy to measure or track. So, you know, if there is sandy soil somewhere that's usually dry, it rains a little bit there and then vegetation shows up, there's a high probability that, you know, there's there's going to be swarms coming out of that area. And so this these conditions were we established earlier in 2019. And so the the right thing would be that you would, you know, inform the teams on the ground that do kind of the monitoring to be able to address it. But the challenge of that particular invasion, even though that early warning existed or was provided, um, the places where it happened were in conflict. So part of the genesis of that particular uh, locus is from Yemen. And so um, there's not much that could have been done. And then and so, you know, it just continued to spiral out of um, out of control. And so a good example, though, would be, um, you know, a not so um dim example of what you could do and it could happen. In the case for drought, um, if you're trying to forecast that there will be food insecurity, we can see a lot of things in the growing season with satellite data. And so you can look at conditions over time, how they compare to, to you know past years. You can quantify damage, you can quantify extreme temperature, extreme rainfall, very low, you know, low or high. And when you do that, you can give an indication of how widespread crop failure might be. And so this might be in the future, right? And so what that would equal, you know, some emergency response, which might be in time for when people actually really need the support. Oh, that could inform a policy, which is where it ties into the policymaker, that the, the government is aware and informed of the extent of the severity so that the response is actually appropriate. So assuming there'll be like, you know, 500 people, and then it turns out it's like 500,000 people are affected you know, it's a, it's a big problem. And so trying to be able to give a better indicator um, of, you know, the level of response that's needed is, is, you know, pretty, pretty important. You spoke a little bit about the growing access to data sets, remote sensing data sets and, and earth observation data sets. Can you, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on how data availability has changed uh, over the years and the types of data that you're using to do this kind of work? So, you know, since the 1970s, we've had land monitoring systems. So we have the Landsat satellites from, from NASA. Uh, they've continued that mission. And the challenge in the past was, one, we couldn't store all the data. And two, there were not enough downlink stations in order to store the data. And so if you go try to go back in time, you find huge gaps in observation. In addition to the fact that the, part of the value of remote sensing is the frequency. So if you're trying to understand something over time, you need to see the same place over and over. And so um, then there is a MODIS satellite. Um, it's called MODIS. It's a moderate resolution satellite. Um, and I now actually, I don't think it counts as moderate anymore, um, considering the new ranges, but, um, it is, it collects data over the earth every day. Right. And those data have been stored since the year 2000 and they're available for the whole world. And in addition to MODIS there's a, a follow on mission that was meant to replace MODIS if it goes down. So it's actually one of those miracle satellites because apparently it was not expected to last more than, I'm going to say two years or three years or something like that. But it's been it's been working since 2000. And its replacement has been in orbit for, I think, for more than 10 years, actually. Like when that one first came out, I was like, oh my God, MODIS is going to disappear. But then it's still, it's still working. And I was terrified because a lot of my research was focused on data coming from that. But this is 250 meter resolution. So for every pixel is 250 meters on the ground. 
this is like not great for if you're really trying to understand what's happening. So the Landsat satellites are 30 meter. 250 meter daily is great because we can see, we can observe large scale things in a, in a pretty decent way. And then uh, around 2008, 2018, 16, 18, um, the European Space Agency launched the Sentinel-1 and 2 um, satellites. And these complement the Landsat satellite. So in places where they were being observed once every 14 days, it became once every three to four days, something like that, right? And so now we're seeing, you know, multiple images uh, every month for, you know, for a specific area. But that doesn't include all the commercial provisions that have been, you know, all the commercial companies that are working in this space. So we have companies like Planet, where we have sub-daily, means two images in, the, in an area. Uh, the, the data might not be directly, you know, utilized the same way as you would utilize Landsat and Sentinel-2, but because of this explosion in terms of cloud computing and capabilities to fuse data sets, you can fuse them and kind of fill in the gaps. So there's, you know, uh, some incredible work that's going on. And what that means is you just have to be able to process all that data and make sense of it. When you say fuse them, what are the, the types of activities you're thinking there? So I'm going to use this example. So you have a Landsat, which is 30 meter resolution, um, Sentinel-2, which is 20 meter resolution, can, and actually 10 meter resolution. Then there's another satellite, which is a radar satellite, Sentinel-1, um, which you know is radar data, not optical data. In order to be able to you to get insights from all of them combined, you need to be able to process them. Um, and sometimes they're from around the same time, so you need to be able to fuse them in the sense that when you're looking at, let's say, a mountain, if you're looking at with optical data, you know, you will probably miss some of the terrain. But when you're looking at it with radar data, you can get the terrain information. And so um, it's kind of an alignment problem of you have all these images of different, you know, different geographical areas, different time, different um, modalities. And like, exactly. how do you layer Use them, them together? So exactly. Yeah. So that you're not using them separately to understand what is happening. Uh, so a, a big part of the technical part of your talk was focused on some of the the key challenges that you face in trying to apply this kind of new wealth of data to, to solving the uh, food security problem. And, you know, we were just talking about this, you know, this as a wealth of data, but uh, that was also your first challenge that uh, in many ways the, the data is lacking in particular uh, with regard to kind of its, you know, realism and the ability to apply it to the types of problems you want to apply it to. And, uh, the availability of benchmarks for the kinds of tasks that you have. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, on that challenge and, and we can dig into some of the things that you've done in your research to address it? Yeah. So while, uh, you know, while we're just talking about the explosion in data sets and, you know, there's been an explosion in products coming from these data sets. So we see a lot of gro uh, global products on land use and cropland among other things, you know, building data sets um, that you could, you know, utilize for many, many different uh, use cases. The problem and the challenge is when you start looking at, um, you know, very specific geographies. So if a model has been developed to work really, really well for mapping maze in, in the United States, you know, it probably work okay-ish in, um, in Europe, maybe pretty well, um, because of the type, I'm going to use the word type of agriculture. So we have, you know, uh, monocrops, uh, highly mechanized agriculture, um, and if you're trying to understand yield, typically the farmers have combined harvesters, so they know exactly what's coming out of their field. Um, it becomes kind of pretty straightforward to develop. I'm using the word straightforward. It's not so straightforward, you know, but it is much more straightforward considering, you know, the other example I'm going to give. And so you can measure, uh, you can kind of forecast and give a good indication of what productivity will be in the United States. Um, a good data set that I really like to, you know, uh, kind of highlight is the United States Department of Agriculture keeps um, updates this, what's called a cropland data layer. It's a really interesting data set. Like you can see croplands over the last couple of years, over I think maybe 20 years in the United States. And you can see, sh you know, shifts and changes where, where people are growing wheat have switched to this or how they switch, how frequently they switch. 
and it might seem trivial, but it's actually a really good uh, data set in the sense that if you have, in addition to just where things are growing, how things are growing and how they're performing, you know, you can clearly understand that, you know, the production area for maybe for wheat is changing because it's, you know, declining in one area and, you know, it remains steady over another area. So, which could be due to warming temperatures, shifts in spring and stuff like that, right? And so when you, you know, flip it on its head, uh, in a sense, when you start looking in um, much more complex agricultural systems, so in, um, in East Africa, you might find that for every one field that is um, in the corn belt of the U.S. might be about 20, 30, 40 fields. Uh, in addition to it does not only have corn, there are multiple other crops in it. Um, people plant at different dates. People have completely different management practices. And so some of the very basic data sets that are required to start building models to understand production are incredibly challenging. So doing field boundaries, um, using existing free data like uh, Sentinel-2, which is 10 meter resolution, is not actually easy when you're looking at smallholder agriculture because the fields are really, really small. Um, in addition to the fact that they're small, there are multiple crops. And so um, you want to be able to develop processes or models that can help you model that better so you can give a better indication of what the outcome at the end of the season will be. One interesting thing, you know, that I think about too sometimes is like, you know, that agriculture might be criticized as, um, you know, not so great, like, why don't they do it the other way? Or, you know, of course, you know, it will, you know, maybe in the future, everything will be sorted, all the fields will be larger, among other things. But recognition that large scale agriculture is actually in the long term detrimental, even short term sometimes, to uh, food systems, ecosystems, entire ecosystems. So you actually want to be able to monitor the small scale mixed type fields better because this is where the future of a sustained system is. And so we want to be able to do that um, a lot better. So use what's available, where we're advocating to get better things that are most suited to understand the systems. So you can provide you know, a better indication to a farmer who might be mixing things to tell them, you know, um, or to show them, give them evidence that this particular crop does not generally do well for your region and be attracted over many years over a really large area. And farmers that grow this, this ends up being the more lucrative crop uh, and not keep them doing or developing or investing in those crops that are not actually, are not actually meant to see them through um, you know, poverty. It's an interesting idea. What I'm hearing there is that, because uh, I had that same thought, okay, so, you know, there's those uh, small scale farmers are in some stage of progression towards more efficient, you know, large scale farming. And what I'm hearing you say is actually it's a, it's an adaptation. Small scale farming is an adaptation to their conditions. And, you know, from that perspective, you know, while it may be less efficient in some ways, it's more efficient in others for the actual situation on the ground where they are. Mm -hmm. So we use, think about it, you use a lot less fertilizer, a lot, a lot less inputs. A good example in East Africa, um, maize, maize is grown with beans. Beans are a nitrogen fixing crop. So the maize benefits from the nitrogen coming from the, from the beans. And so the, it's like kind of like a self-fertilizing um, system. But if you have, um, you know, a highly mechanized agriculture, there's no way to have the beans without destroying the maize for example. Um, and so I think I always think about it this way. Let's not adapt the agriculture to our technology. Let our technology um, support the approach to agriculture. Yeah. Like I, it's so hard, you know, like measuring uh, yield or productivity or crop type in a mixed field is so, so hard. It's probably next to impossible. It's one pixel, two crops, right? Um, <laughs> but to me, it is so important that we can have some a way of, you know, giving some indication. This crop, this field is mixed, and when they're mixed in this combination, you know, twenty percent, thirty percent, this is what the yield will be, you know, across the two crops. Like that is for me a much more rewarding um, outcome than you know being 
trying to push farmers to just grow one crop so we can measure exactly what is coming from that one crop because they're benefiting from, you know, this relationship, the symbiotic relationship between maize and beans, you know, <laughs> where I come from, actually. Um, it's weird. We're trying to we have this project where we've been collecting street level imagery and uh, we're trying to use computer vision to to basically the street to sat yeah so it's a project street to sat is like a baby not a baby it's like the twin brother to another project called helmets labeling crops so the helmets are taking pictures as they're riding their motorbikes and then street to sat is how we come from those images to the labels that we need for our other pipeline and uh every time we're looking so we're trying to create like a, a data set um we're trying to label a data set that then will feed into street to sat to detect crops over a large area and every single time we and go if i can if i can <laughs> well, continue sorry Let me continue, you're getting you at something yes. good. no i was yeah. gonna say that um and every time we look at these images the images of where i'm from you would find bananas beans uh you find bananas beans a plant of sugarcane a, pen, a plant of um um pineapple and be like it's like it's like an all-in-one image <laughs> it's all in one image and every single so like when we're doing our label cafe and are going through the images um I'm, i have to be in the label cafe to be like mm, that's not that that's not this that's not this but it's like you know by default you know that that is like uganda because this is like a, a thing you know you go you you can get your pineapple in that corner right there and then you can have a thing of sugarcane to eat while you're working and then you have your beans and then you have like it's just like total you know total complete you might actually have a coffee plant you know under the tree because coffee does well under under trees so you know it's quite it's quite interesting talk more about street to set like it it what i'm gathering is that you you've got folks on motorbikes with with cameras on their helmets and, and you know maybe cars with cameras or something else and you're taking these these images from the edges of fields and using that to try to enrich overhead satellite data is that right so um that sounds crazy it is fun <laughs> <laughs> um so to give a good example typically the way you collect training data for let's say crop type uh, so we could we can identify from a satellite image what's crop not crop like what's a crop field and what's not not a crop field you can look at the time you know like a time series data and you can tell around the start of the growing season you have to have all of this context around the start of growing season you can see something go up and then down which could be a crop right so you can generate labels for that so we do you know on-screen digitization for that you cannot do this for crop type you could for some if you have very high resolution data like i know what a banana looks like from space at three meter resolution there's a very clear pattern bananas are grown spaced out because they you know their leaves go really wide you can tell a palm tree for example from any other tree um but uh even in in the u.s sometimes trying to distinguish maize from space at cost resolution like you know the cost resolution without any prior information, you might not be able to do that. Um, and then of course, where we're working, you have a lot smaller fields, a lot, um, a lot of mixes. And so we want to generate a, you know, a decent sampling, a, a decent training set that then you could train you hundreds of thousands, billions of pixels uh, over the area. And so to do this, you would typically go with your phone or GPS, stand in the field, be like, with the GPS, we have these applications like Open Data Kit. You you know stand there, record location, crop, noun, crop, open what the crop is, and then you would go, um, you know, go to the next. So if you're doing this, imagine going on a you know multi multi month hike over a really large area because um, you need to walk from one field to another. So I've done a lot of this. It takes a lot of time. It takes forever. But the number of samples you get are so few than if you did it like an entire year because we're trying to do things not only in time, but in space. So you want to map, to map a whole country, not a small region. And so this is you know where this idea of um, sort of doing helmets came from. The idea is GoPro cameras have location, right? Um, and we can take pictures as you're driving. And so 
we were trying to do what we're trying to do is basically collect images, street level images. So as they're riding on the road, they're taking pictures as they're um, they're driving. And so we have, I think, we probably have like over five million images now from maybe six or so countries. And so, and like we've had people who want to volunteer to collect the data. Um, and what that problem, now the new problem is, we have over 5 million images, right? So, you know, machine learning becomes really important really quickly, really, pretty rapidly. Um, so this approach is actually pretty cool in the sense that even without, um, you know, automating, you know, the entire process, we still have 5 million images over really, really, really large geographies. And so we could use those images. You can load them, for example, in Google Earth Pro. You can see the image, the street, and the side of it. And you could, you know, label, you can hand label maize, beans, in this case, which you could not do before. But what we're trying to do with street to sat is reduce this. One is throw away everything that does not have crop. Uh, from the get-go, right? So if no crop detected, thrown away. We're trying to prioritize like key food security crops from each one of the countries. Um, and then what you want to do next is try to detect where crops are, like the specific crops. So we're labeling to create like a crop type, the same as I guess with like, you know, trying to detect what, if it's a cat or a dog in an image, we're trying to detect whether it's maize or beans. Um, in an image. And so, and then we would basically run our entire database through it and then be able to evaluate how the model is performing. And hopefully, you know, we'll come out with over a million images over, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers across uh, really, you know, large countries. Because we also want to capture the heterogeneity, like um, maize in, um, I'm trying to think of like maize in, Germany does not look like maize in, you know, parts of the U.S. Oh, you know, beans, some beans look very different. So we want to be able to capture these crops in different conditions um, is what we're trying to achieve. And it's, you know, it's a it's a really fun project. Also, in addition to the fact that, you know, we're, we're involving and working with everyday people, extension agents, students, uh, ta moto taxi drivers uh, collecting the data. Um, you know, it's, uh, and we're trying to do it in many, 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 many countries. So. Yeah. You shared in your presentation, a kind of a high level snapshot of the processing pipeline that you use for a street to set. It's all Google cloud. It looks like you've got some functions in there and you throw stuff up on Firebase. Uh, I, I guess we don't need to go super deep into that, but it's, it's, um, I guess it strikes me as cool that the, all that's available for this use case. So um, the, the, you know, our initial pipeline of street to stat was actually developed by a, a graduate student in computer science in our department uh, at the University of Maryland. And it's kind of been iterated on over and over. But um, Ivan, who is our machine learning developer, sort of worked on um, trying to automate, like once images are uploaded, they trigger a function that then triggers street to stat, and then we get an initial detection. Um, and then part of what uh, Madhava, who developed the initial street to sat, part of his task was to um, make sure that we can get, you know, a distance estimate. So the, the thing, the point I didn't actually mention before is that the image is on the road, but we want the field. And so um, he was trying to, you know, part of the initial work that he did was trying to move the point from the road into the field. And then we've worked with a, a different uh, team of students. That actually sounds like a really tough problem. Like it's a got, really tough problem. Depending on the orientation, you might have fields all around you. So which way do you project the 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 point? <clears throat> you looking at like accelerate accelerometer data in the images or something? So there is. So the images are time stamped, and the rule is the um, the camera is always facing the passenger side no matter what the country is, right? And so we have the timestamp, which gives us timestamps, and the direction is sort of what we use to figure out where the field is, that's one point. But then, um, you know, some of, the, some of the initial ideas were around doing things like doing structure from motion to like determine exactly the distance from the road, you know, from, the, from the car or the motorbike to the field. But there's things that the things that we're looking at, you know, they're not buildings or cars. Like maze stands are like little, 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 like little, 
that are little lines. So like observing the same thing in multiple directions is not that straightforward. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's, it's an interesting problem still. That's, that's kind of what uh, makes it really interesting. And so right now, you know, our main focus is, so we have kind of like that initial street to sat set up. So once we upload images, uh, the initial street to sat detects uh, sugarcane and maize and gives us a preliminary map with a location of where those fields are. So you can evaluate that data set, for example. But what we're working on now is adding more crops and then trying to create what would be a test set so that whenever the model produces, you know, whenever we go through the, you know, the complete database, we have a good indication of like where things are and can actually evaluate whether the, the, you know, how, how well the model performed. Um, and then there's another component of it, which is uh, initially when we were thinking about it, uh, we would just use an app for labeling. So we also have that uh, data set. So, you know, we're just labeling on um, an application uh, on the phone, which is you just move the field. You just move the photograph to the crop that it is. It still doesn't fix the distance. Uh, you know, it doesn't fix the location part, but we definitely have like, you know, somewhere to start. So it's not like there's no direction and no location. We have location and direction. We just need to be able to move the point to the right field. The other complexity is, remember my description of the very small fields? As you're driving, you could go through 30 fields in a minute. I'm making that up. I'm making, I'm making, I'm making that up. It's not 30 minutes, it's not, you know, 30 fields in a minute. It, it could be, it could be five fields in a minute, right? It's not like, you know, when you're in Kansas or, uh, Illinois, when you're not in Illinois, where you're like, we, it's just one field, right? For, for at least a minute. Okay. And so being able to move the image to the right corresponding field is actually still hard. Um, so yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Is street to set related to the crop harvest work? So street, so crop harvest is, um, a database or a, a data set, a package where in order for us to develop these crop land, crop type maps, we spend a lot of time labeling and or trying to collect crop type data. But there are a lot of people who are doing it. And so Crop Harvest was born out of the fact that uh, we can ingest other people's data, our own data into a package that feeds into our um, pipeline, open map flow for crop land mapping. And so it is, it's an open source, um, open access data set with over 90, maybe we're like at 100,000 uh, cropland and crop type labels that are sort of machine learning ready that you can pull them in your pipeline um, for your own um, training. And um, the open map flow, the way it's kind of set up is not only for crop, crop land, crop or cropland. Um, if you have labels for other use cases, you can do it. For example, if it's buildings or forest, for example, you could utilize it to do the same. Um, so, but it, the idea was being able to use what's available and make and streamlining it so that it's like not like you know different. You, that you have to do a lot of work to to be able to go to the next level in your in your workflow. And so, every data that we collect feeds into crop harvest and when we collect and uh, when we are happy with our labels from street to sat they will be made public through crop harvest as well as you know the csv files with the you know crop uh, and the location let's maybe jump into open map flow one of the the challenges that you talked about is this idea of scaling uh deployment and in particular you were referencing this idea that you know i guess maybe is kind of the the classic uh you know, academic versus real world, like a lot of the studies will stop at this model, but what you really need is a, a map in your case um, and this ability to get uh, dense predictions. Um, can you elaborate on that challenge a little bit more and, and what's that and that gap between, you know, what you see a lot and what you need uh, and then talk about how open map flow fits into that? So there is, um, I mean, with... With a lot of research, usually you're very you're studying a very it's usually a very defined problem. So either it's a small area, um, and you know you collect all the labels for your small area. You develop you build your model perfectly, and you know you evaluate it and you know publish your paper. 
when it comes to coming from that small sample area that you've, you know, I don't know, thrown every possible tool at and try to do it over a larger area, it becomes a lot, a lot, you know, it becomes very, very complicated. So as part of um, Open Map Flow, the, you know, kind of the, the motivation for it is that we get requests and all with our own work, we need to develop these very basic products. So we need cropland because we want to know where crops are so we can look at their conditions or we can try to look at yield. We will need crop type, you know, going further up and, uh, um, down the line. So in order to do this at scale continuously, it, you know, with the capacity we have, we can't be doing it from scratch every time. Um, and so uh, Open Map Flow, you know, developed by Ivan, who's our machine learning engineer, is motivated by one, optimizing resources. So every time you try to use deep learning models in cloud compute, you know, it, it just becomes too expensive. In addition to we are trying to predict over really, really, really large areas. The question is, we want to know how much does it cost if somebody wanted to do it? One of, that's one of the questions, you know, we want to know how much it costs in terms of input and time. So like in, you know, in the initial work, it just like took, it took a really long time to get to where, where it is right now. But where we are is that we have a clear kind of work stream, a very well documented process that's all public. Um, we have tasks that are set for ourselves. And um, the, the, I think the other part is being able to have additional people contribute to our work, as well as if we have new team members, we can continue to produce these things that we said that we do and we do really well. That's the other thing. And so coming from developing a cropland map for Togo, this is in 20, 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, where the Togolese government wanted to know where all the croplands are for a program that they were trying to implement to be able to fi figure out where to send money, where farmers might be. Um, so uh, cropland is a, a proxy for where farmers are. And so, um, and they needed the map in 10 days. So imagine the scrambling that, it's not a lot of scrambling that we had to do. One, there were no labels for Togo. There might have been less than 10. So um, labeling Togo, uh, running it and then evaluating the map and then delivering it. That was a process. And then the next part was, can we uh, run this at scale in the sense that Togo, Kenya is many times the size of Togo in a larger country with, you know, more complexity because parts of Kenya has different ecological systems. And so there's these things that you have to consider when we're training the model, like the density of your samples, like all those sort of, sort of the, you know, additional things. It becomes even much more complex in other countries or it's simplified in others. And so then there was Kenya. And then we had to do it for six countries. Then we had to do it for Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania. So the question is like, how do we get, how do we not do what we did during Togo? How do we, you know, how do we not do what we did during Kenya and kind of keep those parts that work really smoothly and kind of have them um, streamlined? That's where um, Open Map Flow is. And since we're, you know, it's the same kind of the input is the same. So time series of Sentinel, Sentinel one, Sentinel two data. Um, you can utilize it for other things like buildings or forests because, you know, we use the same data sets to map these additional things. So it's kind of a, it's a Python library and it's, it like maps out your entire pipeline for processing these images, training models, and then creating at the end maps. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, uh, in addition to, you know, after you run your model, you know, look at the, um, evaluate it, you can decide whether you want to, you know, develop a map or if you want to improve your training data uh, in order to actually get to an accuracy that is acceptable. So uh, try and if we get, you know, if the model's accuracy is 0 0.001, we probably don't want at all to bother with, um, you know, running it at scale. And so we kind of set like a threshold of 0 0.7, 0 0.75 before we can, you know, try to develop a map that then is evaluated. So in addition to once the product the final map is produced it's not final it has to be evaluated and so on top of that um i have a student who's developed this tool for evaluating so like a, a, a graphical user interface based on google earth engine 
for someone who does not need to know how to make a map or you know do fancy things, but they can zoom in and out and kind of evaluate where the map is doing poorly. And then we use those as input, you know, as training into the model again and try to improve it for the next iteration. Because there's also the fact that you might have a, you know, a 90 whatever something percent accuracy. Uh, but in fact, your model is, the output is really poor. So we use this example showing, you know, what cropland is in the smallholder systems that we're looking at, an existing global product that has potentially, you know, an F1 score of 0.7, right? But when, and then the, with the same score in another region, you know, it's clear that it is cropland. So the fields, the fields in the United States or in Europe have clearly, you know, fields. With the same accuracy over Kenya or Rwanda, you might find, you know, very poor results. And that's because, you know, either the design of their um, their approach is flawed in some sense where the labels are coming from a specific area or the people who did the labeling are not familiar with the context of the you know the other countries or the distribution of labels is not does not represent the area that they're mapping. So those are some of like the additional things, and so we have that end 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 uh, end end evaluation where um, somebody looks at it and determines whether it is good enough. You know, we can never get it to a hundred percent of beautiful painting, but we want to be confident that you know we don't have a whole city labeled as crop, <laughs> for example, right. uh, or a whole <laughs> swamp labeled. You know, a whole swamp. Um, you know mapped as cropland just because we train the model really poorly and they're like the, the part of the complexity too which is where trying to think about things like these what they call agroecological zones the distribution of crops in time and in space um, in addition to very complex or simple crops like rice that might have the same exact temporal uh, signal as a swamp with um, just some grass right and so this is where the problems end up happening, where you have something labeled as cropland when it's actually just a, a swamp. Um, so, yeah. And usually people who know these areas, you can just sense like that, that is wrong. <laughs> like automatically, you know, they don't need to actually be physically on the ground, but they know that this area is definitely swamp. Or if it is crop type, they know this is definitely a sugarcane belt and not maize, you know, so your map is really bad. So open map flow provides a way to kind of close that feedback loop uh, and pull labels back into the system based on the predicted maps. Interesting, interesting. So the, the, the third challenge is this whole idea of learning from limited label data. And you, you just mentioned this broad challenge of context. Um, and you're doing some interesting things to try to address that um, multitask learning and what you call task informed meta learning. Can you talk about that that challenge broadly and those approaches that you've developed? So this is uh, the meta learning and the task meta, uh, task informed meta learning has been work that's been developed by our other machine learning uh, developer, Gabriel Singh, who's at McGill University. And specifically, this is going towards the um, crop type mapping. So while we're compiling crop harvest, so while we can do crop land, I would say that doing crop type properly is you know the end end objective because we want to know conditions for specific crops. Um, but even in our ninety thousand plus um, data set of crop, you know crop type labels over 80 or 90 percent of them are actually just crop non-crop and there's very limited crop type and um, one of the reasons for this is well it's expensive to collect as i mentioned before and one of the motivations of course for uh, helmets and street to sat is that we want to be able to have labels over really large areas but prior to that um, in uh, I think in 2020 or 2021, um, we had these labels from um, from Kenya, from a small region. And so Gabby kind of set out to evaluate whether with these small, these very few labels, you could generate a decent 
map. So part of the limitation, of course, is that you can only you can't really evaluate it over a really large area. But would uh, a meta learning or a task inform meta learning model perform? Um, you know, give similar results compared to like other other models. So you know, trying to do to use like random forest for crop type mapping when you have sixty labels over a whole county in Kenya. Um, does not really work. And so that's kind of the, the motivation for that. So at the same time, while we're trying to learn efficiently, we're also trying to address the gap. So then, you know, later on, we can, you know, we can further evaluate whether the meta learning model will perform the same as or better than one if we have, you know, uh, if we're drowning in labels in that sense. And so with the multitask learning, how does the multitask help kind of inform uh, that context? Meta learning models typically, you know, work, you basically try to kind of pre-train on a lot fewer labels. The other, I think the other component in, uh, in that particular pipeline is the fact that um, you can kind of sort of pre-train a model with uh, giving it examples of like what crops generally look like in a particular area. And then, uh, you know, find, and then try to uh, prioritize those labels for that specific task. So, uh, I think it's also one of the one of the motivations for um, for crop harvest in the sense that when we're trying to do cropland mapping in Kenya, there were other labels from other places. So are there other things we can learn about um, cropland generally, and then can we learn that can be useful for understanding cropland specifically in Kenya? So the case for maize is that you know, giving a model examples of what maize looks like, because we might have more maize labels in the United States first and in France, but not so many in Kenya. Is there inf useful information that the model can utilize to better to better map um, maize in in Kenya? Uh, I guess I'm trying in my head to, to combine multitask, which I think of as like, you're training some model and it has multiple objectives and, and you're kind of fusing them together and uh, meta learning, which is like learning languages, like it learning, a like abstract construct, abstract things uh, that help the model like perform better. I think the summary there is that labels are a big problem in the, the use cases that you're trying to work on and um, in addition to kind of building out data sets and kind of tooling for mapping, there's algorithmic work that can be done um, to use techniques like multitask and, and meta learning to try to enhance your ability to create models in these limited label uh, data environments scenarios, yeah. So use you know, what might be available in other geographies where the data might be more readily available. So, and then um, in addition to, I mean, when I think the biggest challenge we've had, so um, Gabby tried to run, um, you know, uh, try to scale the maze model that performed really well for this small area. But even, you know, with the result that we have, we don't have any data to evaluate the result because over the larger area, we don't have examples of that specific crop that we're trying to map. And so, which is why we're like approaching these, like all these problems, even though they're very, they're different, but the same, they're all part of the, you know, the broader objective addressing that. Cause I think, you know, even if we were able to get to a really um, efficient model, in the long term, but if we can't evaluate it over the larger area, um, we would still be, you know, we'd still not be at a, a good place in that sense. Yeah, I mean, part of what strikes me is really cool about the approach you've taken is that you, just all of the systems that you've created that kind of tie together to, you know, ultimately solve this, this set of big, hairy problems. Yeah, I think, as when you're working on one, you realize that you know something is a, a huge. There's a huge gap, and in order to advance this one task, you will need to advance this other task. And so, 
while Gabby is trying to work on, um, um, you know, crop type mapping, we're also trying to figure out a way of addressing the crop type um, data gap. And so when these two things converge in the future, uh, we would have a very good space. So when we're developing, so within Open Map Flow, it used to be called um, Crop Mask. It was, you know, the, there's a, a part of the pipeline that focuses on crop mask generation. In that process, we had to streamline label generation. So we use a platform called Collect Earth Online that allows you to look at multiple time uh, time series of multiple different uh, satellite images that then we you know that we use to derive our our labels. And so, like part of what um, Ivan did was trying to figure out how to one um, create your labeling your labeling projects uh, your your label link project, and once it's done, it's pushed into Open Map Flow. That then you know gets into your. Um, then you have your map at the end that is evaluated. Then you run it at scale, and then someone evaluates it. That then feeds back, so that it's not like individual things that are all hanging out on their own. You know, so that um, you're not when you're in Collect Earth, you don't necessarily you know, it's not such a download this pull this here put this here type process so it's you know it's a huge uh a, a huge efforts towards efficiency in the in the entire pipeline and we hope that you know the crop type mapping would also be at that same level once we have the labels of course which is where street to sat comes in um that once we have street to sat it would need you know it emerges into crop harvest that crop harvest is already uh, married to open map flow that then improves our uh, crop type mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you mentioned the kind of the the Togo scenario and your ability to to kind of provide this rapid response to the government there in ten days. Are there other um, kind of success stories or? You know, moments or projects that you and your team are proud of as an example of what this kind of work can enable? There's this, is, uh, I guess there are many. <laughs> One right now we're working on um, supporting a regional food balance sheet, which is meant to give a regional indication of product, uh, crop productivity across multiple countries, in, including Zambia, Malawi. Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya. The idea is that all of these countries have some place where they understand what production is in the larger region because it may be, you know, exchange of crops. So the dashboard goes beyond just production. It looks at prices, among other things. And so our contribution in this is trying to do um, yield forecasting at scale. And so at scale in the sense that as in, in multiple countries, using the same approach, you have the same understanding. Um, what's really good about this is that it gives an indication uh, for a policymaker like what to do, um, who who to, who to have deals with, you know, um, because fundamentally one of the biggest problems, I, I did not give this example, I, was there, I give it more and more nowadays, is that um, one of the biggest problems in Africa is infrastructure, which impacts on food security, because you can't just move things if you want to. Uh, there's not, you know, storage facilities among other things, and it's easy to, you know, import for Egypt to get wheat from Ukraine. It's a lot easier than it is to, for it to get it, for example, from South Africa or Zambia. And so, um, this understanding can open up markets and opportunities for these countries to collaborate and trade among each other. But um, another example is this uh disaster risk financing which is sort of like you know one of the things that kind of motivates um my work is that the data sets we have can give us an indication of how to respond better or do things better and so the motivation of this project was that in this particular region in the northeast of uganda droughts always happen uh this there's always crop failure um, almost every year in some pockets of this particular region. And the question is, how early can we know and how bad are things? Uh, and so what's the scale of our response? And so the idea was to use remote sensing data to um, 
be able to answer those questions. So the level of severity across the region and the government um, has um, got a loan or has a loan or a grant from the World Bank. And they had this pot of money that was intended for if there's a problem, you use this money distributed in this region based on some method, some metric. Um, and so um, part of what we did was use remote sensing to determine the severity of drought over the long term in space and in time, and then determine to at what level, like set the threshold, at what level do we decide that there's going to be a problem, we should release funds, and then when we release funds, how do we distribute it in space? And so this project ended in 20, I think 2020, they're working on a phase two, uh, developing the phase two for the project going forward. And so what that means is, you know, it's it's even though like that sort of pipeline was set and worked for that for that period, for what we have to do is we need to do it better in the sense that there are newer data sets. Maybe MODIS won't be able, so MODIS is the satellite I mentioned before, won't be available to support understanding the severity in space. In addition to its resolution, you know, it's, it's, it's very poor for the context of this region, is that then you want to be able to do it better for the next iteration. Um, and ultimately what it meant is that um, people had access to other uh, sources of income that is, you know, outside of working in their fields that were, um, you know, projected to fail in the end. So that's kind of like one of the one of the other examples. And of course, um, around accessibility, getting more people to use the tools. Um, we've had countries implement pro monitoring processes based on work that we have done. Um, and of course, my favorite is um, working with individuals and um, getting them to utilize and access and Con contribute to uh, the development processes of our pipeline. So street to sat would not exist uh, um, if helmets did not exist, and helmets would not exist if uh, border border drivers, motorcycle taxi drivers, um, and students and uh, collaborators in all these different countries, you know, were not willing to try these things out with us um, because you know when you're experimenting, you're like, oh no, you're doing it wrong. Oh no. Uh, maybe go back here. Uh, oh no, you know, there's a lot of lots and lots of oh no's. And I mean, one of the other things is like in the initial phases of uh, Street to Sat, um, what we ended up doing was we went to an agriculture experimentation site and, you know, they let us drive around the site and try to do these measurements, you know, from the car to the, to the field and, you know, the height of the crop, uh, those types of things. Um, so being able to do that and work with local researchers is is, is incredibly um, rewarding. I've run into like a lot of students that I've worked with who you know went on to get masters, um, who went on to get jobs that they're proud of, and you know that's actually probably much more rewarding than um, in any of all the other things. Oh wow! wow. Are there things that jump out at you as big? Uh, you know, needs or gaps or opportunities for, you know, maybe folks that are listening that might want to, um, you know, contribute in this field in some way? Well, definitely crop type. <laughs> <laughs> crop type. Um, I mean, there, but there are lots of people. I mean, that's the other thing about the, the increased access. There are a lot of people looking at these problems. And so I'm, you know, in the, in the future, short term, there will be, you know, really good ways to go about this. Um, but I think some of the things that jump out to me is, you know, around policies and structures that uh, support this development of these processes. So um, having more policymakers open um, to the integration of these tools in their workflows. In addition to, I think, you know, generally as scientists and researchers being able to communicate our work in a way that, you know, does not scare people up, does not scare people away. But um, I think the other is, of course, which ties into the communication is like being able to demonstrate the true potential and its linkage to actual challenges, I think, is um, one of the most incredible things that we can do as researchers. And um, I'm hoping more and more people can you know, can do that.
Well, Catherine, thanks so much for uh, sharing a bit about what you're working on. Very fascinating and important stuff, and I really enjoyed learning about it. Thanks, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks.